हेलो राम हेलो राम सर हेलो कैन कैन वी स्टार्ट यस ओके वी आर स्टार्टिंग द प्रोग्राम रेस्पेक्टेड श्री एन राम प्रोफेसर के एम सी Dr. Joy Element and other dignitaries. Good evening, and all are welcome to Sri Kayar Narayanan Birth Centenary Lecture Series. I am Dimbi Devakar. On the behalf of Institute of Parliamentary Affairs and Kerala Institute of Local Administration, I welcome you all to this program. This is the fourth lecture in the Kayar Narayanan Birth Centenary Lecture Series. The first three lectures were delivered respectively by. Ambassador Shivashri Karmana, Professor Gopal Guru, Professor Pradhan Banu Mehta. Today, Sri N. Ram would speak on the topic right-bearing citizenship in the time of Hindutva. Sri N. Ram is one of the most respected journalists in India. He is the director and former editor in chief of Hindu group of publications. In his dis distinguished life in journalism, which is more than four decades long. Decades long Sri Ram wrote on various issues, including Indian politics, aspects of India's foreign and nuclear policy, external pressures on economic and political sovereignty, issues of corruption and abuse of power, challenge of communalism and fundamentalism, freedom of expression, role of media in society, the Sri Lankan ethnic crisis, and many more. One of the most remembered episodes of Sri Ram's journalistic career is. the invest investigation into both both was corruption corruption scandal this investigation in association with chitra subramanyam and others was recognized by columbia university's graduate school of journalism as one of the 50 great stories investigated and reported over the century sri ram is an author of many books and articles why scams are here to stay Biography of K. R. N. R. K. Narayanan, Early Years, 1906-45. Other uh, with uh, Susan Ram, The Riding the Nuclear Tiger, are some of them. Sri Ram is the recipient of many prestigious awards. This include Padma Bhushan by Government of India, Sri Lanka Rekna by Government of Sri Lanka, and Ram is a former member of National Integration Council and the India-China Eminent Persons Groups. he is the president of harmony india an organization dedicated to the promotion of communal harmony and secularism it is a great honor to invite sri n ram to this program welcome sir professor k m sidi is the chair of today's section he is the director inter university center for social science research and extension mahatma gandhi university kottayam he was former dean of social sciences and former director of the school of international relations and politics mg university professor cd has written extensively on indian politics foreign policy of india kashmir south asian politics and many other areas with immense respect i welcome professor k m cd to chair this lecture kerala institute of local administration is our co organizer in this lecture series I am happy to welcome Dr. Joy Ullman, the Director General, Matthew Andrews, Assistant Director, and the technical team of Kila. It is a delight to invite students, researchers, faculty members to this program. Welcome, friends. There will be a question and answer section after the lecture. Please write your questions and comments in the chat box. Once again, a warm welcome to all, to Professor Sidi. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, thank you, Doctor uh, Dimbi. Uh, am I audible? Audible, sir. You are audible, sir. Very much audible. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm I'm delighted to be a part of this uh, lecture series. Uh, thanks, Doctor Dimbi, uh, for having invited me to be a part of this series organized in connection with the uh, the birth centenary of uh, Doctor K. R. Narayanan. Uh, message that he is a great scholar statesman of our country dr narayanan was uh, undoubtedly a person with a strong secular liberal democratic credentials and commitment i i recall his visit to 
Kote Mayara School at Mahatma Gandhi University back in 1989, a few years before Dimbi joined our school. Uh, he came for the, for the Nehru Centenary Young Scholars Conference uh, when your Murthy was the Vice Chancellor. Uh, Dr. Narayanan was at that time the Union Minister of State for Science and Technology. I remember his speech uh, literally shook the audience and uh, the young scholars were greatly inspired by his speech at that time. In fact, uh, uh, that was the beginning of his political career after his stint as a diplomat for a long time and subsequently as uh, the Vice Chancellor of Jawaharlal Nehru University. And uh, after this conference, in fact, I had, uh, I do not know whether uh, uh, some of my colleagues know that I had written half a page report in the Hindu, uh, highlighting the insights generated in the conference, inspired by Dr. Narayanan. Anyway, I, I, I must congratulate uh, Dr. Dimpi and uh, Dr. Uh, Joy Elliman and his colleagues in IPA and Kila uh, on having taken such a good initiative. And um, I could listen to a few of these lectures uh, uh, in, the, in the past, including a speech by Dr. Gobal Guru and others, which actually stimulated our thinking. Uh, today, as uh, rightly pointed out by uh, Dr. Devi, we are fortunate to have uh, an eminent uh, uh, person like uh, Dr. I mean, Sri N. Ram, the doyen of Indian literature, who will speak on right sparing citizenship in the times of Hindutva. Uh, definitely the, the theme holds great relevance uh, for the contemporary period uh, at a time when we are witnessing uh, manifold challenges to citizenship. Um, uh, on the one side, we have uh, this neoliberal globalism, which continues to make inroads into the lives and livelihood of people putting even the basic right to existence at risk. On the other side, the far right assertions tend to undermine the, the secular fabric as well as the social solidarity of our country. In fact, uh, this uh, CAA about which uh, Sri Ram, he had talked, he had turned uh, tremendously on this topic in the past. This is uh, CA is naturally seen as an ominous sign of this neoliberal far right uh, nexus, uh, which uh, I'm afraid may make our society a smoldering volcano. It certainly calls for social and political vigilance across a wider realm of our society. Uh, I'm sure that uh, today's lecture by Sri Ram comes in the background of uh, the publication of an insightful volume on citizenship by Sri Enram, Professor. I think Dr. Siti has lost his link. His bandwidth was low when I look at it. Uh, so, uh, Ramsar can start his lecture, I think. I think he's back, is he? No. Okay, see, you want to give him a minute to try to get back? Before, or... Sorry, can sorry, you, uh, can you uh, hear? Yes, sir, you are audible. Uh, uh, sorry for the interruption. I think... Uh, uh, there is some connectivity problem here. So I just mentioned uh, uh, Ram's uh, uh, and his friends, colleagues' uh, collected work, I mean, this citizenship, which would be an important volume for contemporary researchers on India. And uh, Ram is, uh, is uh, certainly known for his uh, consistent and fearless position on several issues. I'm sure that his credentials Democratic secular credentials are uncontestable. And I'm sure that uh, his today's lecture will also be a, a testimony of his much acclaimed credentials. In fact, I don't want to take much of the time because uh, uh, Ram is expected to enlighten us on this topic very much. Thank you very much. And I, I look forward to a very 
uh, eminent talk from Sri Ram. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank Professor, you, Professor. Uh, Amrita Narayanan is with us, I think. Uh, daughter, of, daughter of K.R. Narayanan. Welcome, Madam. Oh, hello. I, I know her. Hello. Hello. Ram <laughs> sir can yes. start. Thank you, Professor CP, and thank you, uh, Dr. Divakaran and other friends. Uh, the subject uh, I have chosen is uh, a vast one. Uh, and thank you, Professor CP, for also mentioning this book, which, uh, in fact, I'm, I'm going to draw on my contribution to the book and also make reference to some important points made by Professor Romila Thapa on citizenship here. It's too vast a subject to deal with uh, in 40, uh, 30 or 45, 40 minutes, uh, but I'll try to highlight and draw out some main themes that should be discussed and also provide my perspective and views on, on this subject. I've chosen the theme rights-bearing citizenship in the time of Hindutva, because that covers uh, the, uh, what, what, what I intend to say today, citizenship and rights. What are these rights? Uh, what is happening to these rights? That's one aspect of it. Uh, and uh, what has happened to citizenship in, uh, in, 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 in law as well as uh, on the ground when we come to uh, the time of Hindutva, which certainly we are into right now. Uh, before that, let me pay my uh, homage to uh, former President K.R. Narayanan. Uh, I knew him very well. We admired him. Yeah, all of us admired him, but I knew him extremely well. Uh, his thinking, uh, when, of course, uh, he worked for a brief while before he went to the London School of Economics in the Hindu, and also, I believe, in the Times of India. Uh, certainly, he, he was on very good terms with uh, the media and journalism. Uh, but I knew him particularly uh, towards the end of his, uh, no, from, from the time he was ambassador uh, to the United States when I was Washington correspondent. Uh, and in fact, before that, uh, when he was ambassador in China, I, me I met him there towards the end of his term as ambassador and right through. Uh, uh, academic, you know, when he was vice chancellor and later vice president and president, uh, we admired him. And even after that, uh, and uh, I also had the honor of, uh, be, you know, interviewing him. Actually, it was called in corner. You know, he was in conversation on a very important occasion uh, before Republic the day before Republic Day, 1998. The transcript is still available, and if anyone is interested, I, I'll be happy to. Provide uh, uh, pr provide the text. Uh, the uh, but there are very interesting thoughts that relate to the present here, uh, where he talks about when I asked a question about inequality, uh, social inequality and backwardness. Uh, he talked about uh, Jawaharlal Nehru's great passion to change our society. He called it the congealed society. That is. Uh, uh, President Narayanan called it the congealed society which we inherited from our own past and from the static past of the British period. And he talked about uh, the importance of social change in conjunction with economic change. Uh, he was quite outspoken on uh, uh, you know, the denial of e uh, equality, which is I think very relevant to the subject today, but was also positive and uh, optimistic. And for those who want to, you know, he, he, he made a number of speeches, wrote, so there's a lot there. But this is, I think, a notable uh, expression of views uh, and perspectives on the larger picture where India is headed and where the world is headed also uh, from uh, a great man. With that, uh, I, I come straight into the subject because I don't have too much time to deal with the many aspects which uh, are covered by uh, this title. India might have awakened to life and freedom at the stroke of the midnight hour, separating August 14 and 15, 1947. However, as political scientists have pointed out, 
300, and in particular, Niraja Gopal Jail, 365 million subjects of King George VI were not magically turned into citizens at that mid, as that midnight hour struck. And thereby hangs a, a complicated tale. The story of citizenship in India, and in particular rights bearing citizenship, has many dimensions historical, constitutional, legal, philosophical, socio cultural, and political. And indeed, neoliberal policies have left that stamp on uh, citizenship. I shall come to that briefly later on. These aspects intersect, of course. And uh, my contribution to this book that Professor uh, T.P. was uh, referring to is on the evolving politics of uh, citizenship in India. But before I come to that, there's, the lead essay is uh, Citizenship, the Right to be a Citizen by Professor Romila Tapper, a very fine essay, uh, which I think sorts out uh, various things that have uh, got uh, mixed up when we talk about citizenship today. She, point, she begins by starting out that uh, citizenship, in the sense we understand it, does not go back to antiquity, to the Greeks and the Romans, or indeed uh, 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 ancient India. Uh, you, you had, the term was used here and there, but, uh, but citizenship was not available to everyone. So a very important aspect of the idea of citizenship was equality before the state, equality of everybody living in a certain territory with rights. Uh, and uh, till modern times, the idea that all members of a society were entitled to equal rights, broadly speaking, very often in practice, this was, this was not uh, this implemented. It was not enforced, it was not available to everybody. You had slavery, you had serfdom. In India, you had untouchability, you had oppression of lower caste, and of course, classes, the working classes. You had forced labor, bonded labor, and so on. But the concept was very clear, and that concept is only about three centuries old at most. That's the point she makes. And uh, uh, so the idea, and they have rights. Everybody has the same rights in principle, although in practice there are many deficits. It's a very, very important essay because it, I think, uh, uh, it clarifies uh, citizenship. Because no use saying that India enjoyed democracy uh, in uh, you know two thousand years, three thousand years ago, and all that. This is basically in modern times. It's to do with. Uh, the rise of industrialization, first in, the, in, in Western countries and subsequently in other parts of the world. This has to do with capitalism uh, and uh, the rise of middle classes and so on. Uh, this is very well uh, contextualized and things are made and clarified in this lead essay uh, in this book that was, was referred to. And my remit uh, there was to deal with the politics, the evolving politics of citizenship in the sovereign, secular, democratic Republic of India. The transformative or living constitution and our democratic assets, namely parliament and state legislatures, the executive at the center and the states, the judiciary, uh, other institutions that function under constitutional or statutory authority, the news media, civil society organizations, and in the final analysis, to quote from the constitution, we the people of India, individually and collectively. All these supposedly democratic assets, some of them have turn, turned out to be not democratic at all, have a vital role to play in this. The constitution has been designed and the democratic institutions are all formally pledged to promote uh, loyalty, not to any strongman, not to any kind of majoritarianism, but to the core values of the Indian Republic as set out in the preamble to the constitution, namely in, in this order, justice, liberty, 
equality and fraternity. I repeat, justice, liberty, equality and fraternity. How seriously the law and the courts of law take these values matters a good deal. But how society and the political system and we the people respond to these matters these matter even more. And here I want to cite the last speech made to the Constituent Assembly, made on November 25, 1949, by Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, who was chairman of the drafting committee. This he brought out in that speech clearly and powerfully the importance of understanding the interdependence of the principles of liberty, equality, and fraternity, and the importance of getting what he called the union of Trinity right, liberty, equality, and fraternity. He warned against internal threats to democracy and society, such as bhakti or hero worship in politics, to which Indians were particularly addicted. It is quite possible, he mused, for this newborn democracy to retain its form, but give place to dictatorship in fact. And that is what is being attempted in the time of Hindutva. You have the observance of the various constitutional forms, uh, but, uh, but you also see side by side the subversion of institutions, constitutionally or legally established institutions. Uh, but uh, so democracy in form, all these forms are retained. We are not, we don't, there's no proclamation of emergency such as we had uh, in the mid 70s for uh, a couple of years. Uh, but uh, dictatorship, in fact, are we moving in that direction is the question. And if you look at the politics of citizenship, you get some insights so that you can answer this question. If there is a landslide, Dr. Ambedkar observed, he was no doubt referring to an electoral landslide, the danger of the second possibility, that is the dictatorship, in fact, becoming actuality is much greater, I'm quoting from him. In support of this argument, he recalled John Stuart Mill's famous caution to people interested in the maintenance of democracy, not to lay their liberties at the feet of even a great man or to trust him with powers which enabled him to subvert their institutions. Equally important was Ambedkar's warning in this speech against letting the complete absence of two things in Indian society equality, social and economic, and fraternity continue unchecked. The complete absence of two things is, is equality, social and economic, and fraternity. So if you continue to uh, let this, if you allow this to continue unchecked, then I think there is a big danger. And he said, if this contradiction between recognizing the principle of one man, one vote, and one vote, one value in politics. So that's elections. Each person, every citizen has the vote or should have the vote. But, but, in, but uh, the contradiction between that and, and uh, denial of the principle of one man, one value. One man is one man or one woman, same value should be there, but that principle is denied. So. So in other words, equality. If this question was not resolved, he feared or apprehended that political democracy could not be expected to survive. And in a famous statement, in a memorable statement, he raised this question, how long shall we continue to live this life of contradictions? How long shall we continue to deny equality in our social and economic life? If we continue to deny it for long, we will do so only by putting up political democracy in peril. We must remove this contradiction at the earliest possible moment, or else those who suffer from inequality will blow up the structure of political democracy, which this assembly, that is a constituent assembly, has so laboriously built up. So this, I think, was a very important intervention. His last speech in the constituent assembly debates and uh, these were positive, socially radical ideas 
they formed the bedrock of Dr. Ambedkar's thinking and democracy, and in particular, his thinking on rights-bearing citizenship. And uh, now, what is the? What do you mean by the politics of citizenship? Uh, and a citizen is generally defined in the theoretical literature as a member of a political community who enjoys the rights and assumes the duties of membership. That's the general definition in the theoretical literature that a citizen enjoy is a person, is a member of a political community who enjoys the rights and assumes the duties of membership. And the dimensions of this membership of political community are broadly classified as one, citizenship as legal status. And that status is defined by civil, political, and social rights. Secondly, citizenship as political agency. A citizen has to be active in politics, is expected to shape politics, to influence politics, to continually improve it. And citizenship as a source of identity and belonging. I'm an Indian, I'm English, I'm American, I'm Russian, earlier I was Soviet, I'm Chinese, et cetera. Uh, uh, source of identity and belonging. You don't say I'm a Hindu or a Muslim or a Sikh, whatever, or a Buddhist and so on, or, or a Christian. Those are also markers of identity, but that's nothing to do with citizenship as provisioned in the Indian constitution. So these formulations, the, uh, these dimensions are deceptively neat and simple, but they hide a number of contradictions, tensions, fault lines, and they're constantly changing in a globalized world where neoliberal policies have the upper hand. But uh, this will serve as a basis for a working definition. Since governance by the state and the relationship between the state and individuals, groups and communities and classes are, by the, are intrinsically contentious, the politics of citizenship can be conceptualized as, the, as contentious interactions over the institutionalization and realization of substantive membership, legal status, rights, and participation. Now, I won't spend too much time on what these rights are. Let me talk about uh, rights-bearing citizenship. We have in the Constitution a rich resource and what are these rights? Part three of the constitution, fundamental rights. They are to be understood as a guarantee against state action. There are also other general rights. These are, but I'm talking about fundamental rights. And a state means it includes the government and parliament of India, the government and legislature of each state and all local or other authorities within the territory of India or under the control of the government of India. That's what we mean when we talk about fundamental rights, which are a guarantee against improper or unconstitutional state action. And Article 13 is very important of the Constitution. It, it states, it provides that laws which are inconsistent with or in derogation of fundamental rights shall be void. And, you're and then you have a number of rights enumerated in part three, the right to equality, Articles 14 to 18, available, in fact, not just to citizens, but to any person within the territory of India, residing within the territory of India. That is equality before law and equal protection of the laws. Then you have prohibition of discrimination on grounds of religion, race, caste, sex, place of birth, guaranteed to any citizen in this case. Equality of opportunity in matters of public employment, any about abolition of untouchability, abolition of titles. Then you have very important freedoms, the, right, the rights to freedom. It's a bundle of rights, Article 19 to 22. 19, right to freedom of speech and expression, right to assemble peace, peaceably and without arms, right to form associations or unions, right to move freely throughout the territory of India, right to practice any profession or to carry on any occupation, trade or business. And then, of course, reason, these are not absolute rights, but reasonable restrictions. 
uh, can be placed by law uh, on these rights, and they have to meet the test of reasonableness uh, as adjudicated by the judiciary. And there are several other rights, very important uh, uh, rights, uh, Article 20, protection and respect of conviction of offenses. 21 is extremely important, protection of life and public personal liberty available not just to citizens, but to all persons residing within the territory of India, uh, etc. Then you have rights against exploitation, rights to freedom of religion, cultural and education rights, and rights to constitutional remedies. These are available to citizens, also to other persons, uh, depending on which rights they are uh, they're re referring to. They go, can go before the Supreme Court. So. The Constitution has a rich collection of rights in part three, fundamental rights, apart from other rights provided by laws. Uh, but uh, where are we today in relation to these rights? In particular, the right to equality uh, and uh, the right to life and liberty uh, here, the right to equal protection of the laws. Uh, when you talk about uh, citizenship, the politics of citizenship. The political history of citizenship in India, as I have uh, researched it, divides naturally into four chapters. One, the first begins with the making and provisioning of citizenship in part two of the constitution at its commencement. And it takes us to the enactment of the Citizenship Act in 1955. Chapter two turns out to be a relatively quiet period, 1955 to 1985. Chapter three covers the period from 1986 when the citizenship law was amended to make special provision for Assam in line with the 1985 Assam Accord. And it goes up to 2003, 2004, when perhaps the most significant and far going changes were made to the legal political regime governing citizenship. And the fourth chapter yet to be concluded covers what has been happening since December 3, 2004, when the Citizenship Amendment Act 2003, and with it a new citizenship regi regime, an illiberal, restrictive, surveillance-oriented citizenship regime. F uh, foundations for that were laid at, in that last chapter, starting with 2004 and continuing uh, to date and beyond. So let me start with the final chapter to, to make my position on this, on the controversy over the Citizenship Amendment Act 2019 or CAA uh, that was raging for months in the Indian public arena before the global crisis of the COVID-19 pandemic pushed it off center stage, pushed it off newspaper front pages, pushed it off prime television news to the very margins of politics. But he can't be complacent because the Home Minister, Mr. Amit Shah, has recently announced that uh, after everybody's vaccinated, or the vaccination is basically done, we will uh, We'll return to CAA, and it's not just CAA. I'll come to that in a minute. The, so this, this is there's no room for complacency. At the heart of this uh, so-called controversy is the question whether Hindu communal majoritarianism, in other words, the concept of Hindutva put into practice, can be allowed to trump the secular character of the constitution that forms part of its basic structure. A contentious issue that cropped up, in fact, in the wake of partition in the Constituent Assembly debates, an issue that our first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, called a little thing, dust in the pan, became a very big deal in 2019-20. In but it is not just the Citizenship Amendment Act 2019 that is our concern. This has to be viewed in combination or conjunction with two other citizenship related projects, an amplified national population register or NPR exercise and the threatened countrywide national register of citizens or NRC, NPR and NRC. So view in combination with these, the CAA post 
poses a direct challenge to India's democratic and secular polity and to its political stability. And uh, field work of updating the NPR ex, uh, was notified for implementation in all states and union territories between April and September 2020, but has unavoidably been postponed until further orders. And I just mentioned what uh, Mr. Amit Shah says the government has in mind. So the Develop, this development has had four separate but interrelated political components. One, the provocative and polarizing enactment of the CAA. Two, the mass upsurge against it, seen in tandem with the NRC and NPR across much of the country. Three, the repression and violence unleashed on the, on the protesters by both the state and by gangs of bigoted thugs. And four, a potential crisis of federalism manifested by tensions and a possibly showdown between several states and the central dispensation on the citizenship question. I don't have to go into all the constitutional legal questions here for my exploration of the politics of citizenship in the time of Hindutva, but I'll adopt for as my position the following argument presented very elegantly and succinctly by the lawyer Mihir Desai in an article published in the Economic and Political Weekly. And this is what he highlights. The CAA is unconstitutional. Even if it is held to be constitutional by the Supreme Court of India, the protests against it are justified and should continue. I'm quoting from him. If the CAA is held to be unconstitutional, the NPR and NRC must still be opposed since they are exercises that will be extremely detrimental, especially to the poor and the marginalized. I will only add to what he says, the lawyer Mihir Desai says, that lessons must be learned from the updating, so-called updating of the original SM, Assam NRC between 2013 and 2019. This exercise proved a nightmare for millions of the state's residents and it should serve as a warning to the rest of India on what a countrywide NRC would turn out to be for hundreds of millions of people, not a few millions. BJP leaders and the central government have spoken in different voices, have contradicted themselves on the question of how the population register relates to the register of citizens, and also on the question of the 2019-2020 changes in the citizenship law. The answer is simple. There's no need to get confused about it. To get, it's not too complicated. The NPR has no purpose other than to serve as the basis, the data source for the NRC. The NPR is a register containing details of persons usually residing in a specified locality, which may be a village, or rural area, or town, or ward, or demarcated area. And uh, the specified particulars relating to each family and individual residing there. It will be collect these will be collected through house-to-house -house enumeration. The latter, the NRC is purely an administrative exercise feeding off the population register. It will be built up from below, from the local through the sub-district, the district, and the state up to the national level. The process provides for verification, publication of a draft local register of Indian citizens going all the way up, filing of objections and appeals. But the power given to the local registrar to enter remarks in the population register, if he or she feels that citizenship of an individual is doubtful, will be a Damocles sword hanging over the heads of millions of people. The authoritarian nature of the N NPR NRC project becomes clear from a plain reading of the 2003 amendment to the Citizenship Act and Citizenship Registration of Citizens an issue of National Identity Card Rules 2003 framed under the, that amended law. As for the CAA, the connection with the NRC is in the chronological se sequencing. And this was set out by Mr. Amit Shah when he was BJP president in a series of election rallies in April, May, 2019. And uh, 
I quote from that from the, from one of his speeches in 2019. First, we will bring the citizenship amendment bill, and we'll give citizenship to the Hindu, Buddhist, Sikh, Jain, and Christian refugees, the religious minorities from the neighboring nations. Then we will implement the NRC to flush out the infiltrators from our country. In Hindutva speak, in the context of the inflow from Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, infiltrator is code for Muslim illegal migrant, a term first introduced in the citizenship law by the 2003 amendment, and refugee is code for a non-Muslim illegal migrant. The authority, this is the point, the authoritarian and communal nature of the game plan has been executed in stages between 2003 and 2019. And uh, it waits to be completed with the implementation of the NPR NRC mega project. And here we make an, we come to an important point. It is not just the BJP and its allies, which has uh, developed this authoritarian way of looking at citizenship. The Congress, Congress led UPA and the Congress party in particular also has to bear a lot of responsibility for uh, going along with this uh, surveillance oriented citizenship regime. That is a point that is not often highlighted in public discourse, but it is clear that the Congress in government, in power, not just in opposition, was also party to enacting some of these changes. I'll quickly go over some themes because there's not too much time. I still have perhaps 15 minutes. Do I? Do I, Professor Siti, 15 minutes? Yeah, certainly. Okay. Uh, you know, the the debates in the Constituent Assembly were remarkably inclusive, secular and democratic. There were challenges by those who were not quite secular to this, who put forward the views that uh, Hindus have no other country to go to. Uh, so we should give them a special place and so on. And there were also noises made against uh, particularly against those uh, who had gone to Pakistan first and then having cha changed their minds, they came back to India, only a few millions uh, at that time. Uh, and, the, and, the, and they were protected. Their status was protected by the constitution uh, after, these, uh, after the debate in the constituent assembly. Uh, and it's, it's quite interesting, these discussions, but uh, Yawaharlal Nehru, Ambedkar, Alladi Krishnasamy in particular, and various others uh, came out very strongly in favor of the proposition on one thing that you cannot make it when you talk about citizenship, you cannot make a distinction on the basis of religion. You can't have separate rules for Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, Parsis, etc. You, you have to be religion blind like colorblind in this respect. And this was emphasized and overwhelmingly the Constituent Assembly decided, and that was what got into the Constitution. I, I, I've discussed it in detail in that chapter, that, uh, in that book that Professor Siti referred to uh, on this question, and also Gautam Bhatia and Gautam Patel, a sitting judge of the Bombay High Court has also elaborated on the, on the same, same points from the standpoint of the constitution and law, but they were remarkably inclusive, democratic and secular. That was the position. So the present thinking doesn't go back to the constituent assembly debates or the framing of the constitution, in particular, the provisions relating to citizenship. And uh, I don't want to go into who was entitled to be said. They didn't really define citizenship, but they answered the question, who is a citizen or who has the right to be a citizen? And you can look up the details uh, in the constitution as well as in the literature on the subject. I come to an important right, the right to vote and citizenship. A citizen is generally defined, as I mentioned earlier, in the literature as a member of the 
of a political community who enjoys the rights and assumes the duties of membership. And uh, the emergence of political rights has been an integral part of the history of the de of development of modern citizenship as a condition of expanding equality. All those who have the status of citizens are, at least on paper, bearers of equal civil, political, and social rights. And this comes out very, very clearly in the history of Indian elections. Politically speaking, being a voter and being a citizen are intertwined and inseparable. This makes sense from the standpoint of both democratic politics and constitutional morality. If, if in India, only citizens can be enrolled as voters. And conversely, all adult citizens who are not disqualified under the constitution or the laws have the right to be enrolled as voters, regardless of religion, race, caste, or sex. And yet in places in Assam and some other places in the Northeast, people who had the right to vote, who had the epic card, where that right was snatched away uh, under, this, under this authoritarian regime, which goes back, not just 2014, but well before that uh, here. And although our election commission on the whole has done very well over the years, uh, there have been several uh, violations of the right to vote of Indian citizens, particularly in the Northeast and particularly in the state of Assam. And there is an attempt to do that also in other states in the East, in particular in, in the, the largest state there, West Bengal, where elections are due shortly. And uh, one former chief election commissioner, Naveen Chawla, has been a strong advocate of the proposition that the voter identity card is the only card that counts for establishing citizenship. Why? Because the election commission, a high powered authority created by the constitution has done an extraordinary job of enrolling eligible voters, verifying identity and credentials and making the electoral rolls as inclusive and as all encompassing as possible on a scale not witnessed in any other part of the world. Even in the United States, there are several obstacles to minorities voting in some states. They disenfranchise voters, even today. So there's always doubt about whether African-Americans in particular Southern states will be able to turn out in large number because there are many obstacles, there are many tricks that can prevent, prevent them from exercising their franchise, even if they have the credentials to vote. But uh, in India, I think uh, this has been done, on the whole, this has been done quite well. And the current attempt is to snatch, is to take away votes, particularly from Muslims. And once you say that uh, Ill any illegal migrant who's Hindu, Sikh, uh, uh, Parsi, Jain, Buddhist, Christian, this no, can apply for citizenship, but uh, an illegal, so-called illegal migrant who's a Muslim, presumed to have come from Bangladesh largely, has no such right. They'll be uh, detained or deported. I don't know who, how they de deport where. <laughs> you can't deport them to no, no, no person's land. Bangladesh says they are not our, our, our citizens. So this, I think, uh, is a big question. Uh, and it's a question that causes a lot of, uh, lot of concern. Citizenship, I'll come now in the, to the, uh, in, uh, the last part. Citizenship in the time of Hindutva or in the time of BJP. And uh, from time to time, there has been repression, violence, threats, and a variety of human rights abuses, not only in India, but in various other parts of the world, when you talk about illegal migrants, aliens, and so on. And... Uh, Basically, it's the constitution that came in the way of the Hindutva project. The long, what they saw as a long festering problem of the legal status, political role, and future of the, this uh, mass of what they call illegal immigrants. Uh, 
It was a concern for the BJP from 1984. And if you study the election manifestos, I, I have a section on that in this chapter in, the, in that book. Uh, over time, what are the concerns? And uh, it's linked to politics because they think that Muslims vote largely against the BJP, either for the left originally or later on uh, for other parties as well, uh, but not for the BJP. This was a major problem in West Bengal, but also in other parts of, the, uh, of Eastern India and the Northeast. And this was bothering them a lot. The solution worked out in principle by Hindutva and its political arm was depriving the so-called infiltrators of their franchise as well as their citizenship. And as I said, detaining and if possible, deporting them while protecting and embracing the refugees. Remember, infiltrators are not non are Muslims. Refugees are non-Muslims, Hindus and other uh, denominate other religion those belong to other religions but how do you this was the this was the aim this was the objective but how do you implement how do they, they how, how, how does how to implement the solution two things stood in the way first the secular constitution and the citizenship law that stubbornly remained religion blind notwithstanding the exclusionary and Ill, illiberal changes made in installments from 1985. I underlined from 1985 because the Congress regimes were also party to the introduction of these exclusionary and illiberal changes. Secondly, mass political sentiment in Assam, which wanted all foreigners expelled regardless of their religious affiliation. It may, may have been a chauvinist movement, but it was not a communal movement. The, the Assam agitation did not make a distinction between Hindu and Muslim. And in that sense, uh, it was different from the BJP's illiberal and authoritarian approach. Uh, they wanted all so-called foreigners expelled regardless of their religious affiliation. So these were the two obstacles. One, the secular constitution. Second, mass political sentiment in Assam, uh, which was in a sense religion blind. Finding a way past these obstacles became a major political obsession, a major political project for Hindutva. And this is reflected in the party's general election manifestos, particularly from 1989, even earlier, but particularly from 1989. Two years into its first term, the BJP government led by Mr. Narendra Modi, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, found a Hindutva way to resolve the long-standing problem of the legal status, political role, and future of this undifferentiated mass of those who are considered or labeled illegal migrants, uh, illegal immigrants. Now, the problem was there's no data. Governments have repeatedly been asked in parliament, what is the data you have? What is the source? And so on. Various figures have been given, like including up to 25 million people are, uh, you know, there are 25 million illegal immigrants and so on, but no data, no, no documentation is available to show uh, the scale of uh, what they're talking about. So this solution that the BJP dispensation two years into its first term found, it would be based on religious difference with a red line drawn in the citizenship law against Muslims on the myth that all Muslims who came from Bangladesh or Pakistan or Afghanistan are, uh, Ill are not refugees. They are infiltrators. Uh, even words like termites and terrorists and so on have been used uh, in, the, in, in political speech, speeches by Hindutva elements, whereas all illegal immigrants who came, who are not Muslim, from the, who came from Bangladesh, uh, a few from uh, uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, they are particularly, uh, uh, not many from Afghanistan, they are refugees because they have come to the homeland of, uh, and so on. The myth being that they came because of persecution. So the, this is the fiction that all Hindus, Sikhs, Buddhists, Jains, Parsis and Christians 
who had migrated illegally into India from Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Afghanistan had done so on account of persecution or fear of persecution by the Muslim majority theocratic states, whereas all Muslims who had moved to India illegally from these countries had done so for economic and other dubious reasons. And this, you know, if you, if you have to, you can't prove that. You don't have data to prove it. You can't substantiate this. So that's why in order to implement this solution, that's why a citizenship amendment bill was introduced in the Lok Sabha in July 2016, referred to a joint parliamentary committee passed by the lower house in January 2019, but it couldn't go further because the government then did not have a majority in the Rajya Sabha. So the BJP committed itself in the 2019 election manifesto to enacting this amendment and it has done exactly that. And this will have, in conclusion, I want to say that this will have consequences, implications, not just for Muslims, but for India's political system and constitution and constitutional morality as a whole. It is a constitution that has been undermined. It's the right to equality, the, the uh, rights to freedom, that are being snatched away, freedom of speech and expression, the right to life, the equal protection of all laws available to all persons, and the panoply of rights that are guaranteed in part three of the constitution are being subverted. And this is up for challenge before the Supreme Court. And as Mr. Mihir Shah, the lawyer whom I quoted at the outset said, even if the Supreme Court strikes it down as unconstitutional, there is still no room for complacency. You have to fight, you got to continue the struggle against N NPR and NRC. And, uh, and even if the Supreme Court finds the CAA Con Constitution Amendment uh, Act of 2019 to be constitutional, it doesn't make it right. It, the, the struggle should still continue. That is the point that uh, comes out because this is unacceptable to a secular, sovereign, democratic republic. Justice, equality, liberty, fraternity. To quote from the preamble to, uh, to the constitution. That is what at stake, not just uh, the 200 million Muslim population of India. Of course, there will be some of them will be specially targeted. There's no need to panic. It's not going to be easy to implement this on the ground. There's plenty of resistance, even from state governments. State assemblies have passed resolutions and so on. But uh, that's where we are today. There's no need to get demoralized on this because it's an important uh, struggle, uh, which has to be constitutionally and politically and peacefully with, uh, continued. Uh, but uh, it involves the very integrity of the Indian Republic and so on. And uh, we've not had time to look at how neoliberal policies have also undermined some of these values. But if there are any questions, uh, perhaps at least briefly, we can try to respond to them. I'm sorry I've taken more time than uh, uh, you intended to give to me, but I think the subject uh, needed a bit of time and. I'll, end, I'll conclude on that note. Thank you. Thank you very much for the enlightening talk uh, on the contemporary challenges to rights-bearing citizenship. Uh, uh, Ram has uh, rightly pointed out the, the, the kind of uh, consensus that emerged among the political parties in the parliament regarding passing of these legislations. Um, uh, rightly pointed out the way the Congress Party under UPA uh, collided with, I should use this word, collided with the BJP in bringing out legislations uh, which tend to undermine uh, the citizenship in this country. And uh, he has also uh, called this particular uh, regime as uh, typically illiberal, uh, restrictive, and uh, surveillance oriented. He has rightly pointed out the way the government has been doing it in the last uh, several years. I think he has traced 
this history of uh, subversion back to the period 1985 and right through 2003 and uh, 2019 was the, not the beginning as you rightly pointed out so the question is uh, if the caucus party has been a partner in this game of subverting the constitution uh, what will be the future of this country i think uh, he has uh, left this question uh, kind of a, kind uh, as a kind of a, a big challenge for the indian people he has rightly pointed out that the the indian constitution the secular indian constitution is the, is the only obstacle to the current regime i do not know how how far we can go ahead with this a uh, particular strategy of confronting when you have a kind of a surveillance raj uh, pervading across a wider realm of uh, activities including the intellectual and uh, academic activities live alone the political activities or like that anyway we we have a very interesting session uh, ram thank you very much for your enlightening talk i am sure that uh, the participants of this conference uh, uh, will read uh, the uh, the volume on citizenship brought out by ram romilla bhatia and others uh, which i i think uh, is an indispensable volume for the current debate on citizenship we have a few questions emerging uh, uh, in the chat box i do not know how much time we have uh, before us uh, dr dimbi is somebody uh, there to read out uh, these questions so that uh, we can save time should i read these questions hello please please read some of the questions select some yeah. of the questions yeah 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 the first question is uh, uh, from joseph anthony is uh, raising this question uh, with respect to the recent judgments from the apex court uh, he is asking this question whether we can expect that uh, since uh, these uh verdicts have a particular uh, uh dimension uh, he is asking this question whether we can expect something from the judiciary to protect the constitution when cases come to them with uh, with regard to caa uh, he is also raising a point whether the the, the question of uh, kerala i think chief minister of kerala uh, recently stated that he will not implement the caa in kerala how far we can prevent this implementation of uh, Central Act like CAA in a state like Kerala. That's the first question from Joseph Henry. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think that that is an interesting question. The first one, I don't want to preempt the answer to the first question. We should hope that the Supreme Court uh, uh, gives uh, comes up with uh, a clear answer to this, a just uh, answer to the question, and strikes it down as unconstitutional. I don't want to preempt saying that it will or will not. it has to be argued but i'm disappointed that the supreme court has not given priority to this issue because the matter is up before it it should have immediately set up a constitution bench and expedited the hearing of this because this is going to be important and it's not only on this but on uh, challenges before what happened in jammu and kashmir and other issues also uh, came up before the court and there's been plenty of criticism by uh, legal scholars and others also pol political writers on uh, on the priority uh, on the you know how the court has sought to prioritize its work in, in this period it's not taken up many of these issues and i'm also personally disappointed with the supreme court but uh, you do hope that uh, this will be properly argued and adjudicated uh, by, by our judiciary high, high, higher judiciary uh, and so on on the second question yes i think uh, there is scope for uh, it's a real problem in a quasi federal system and uh, the chief minister of kerala as well as uh, uh, the chief ministers elsewhere even uh, the, the chief minister of bihar i think came out with uh, saying we, we are not going to do it's not just ca it's it, unless you do and the national population register that exercise on the ground uh, nothing is going to happen uh, so the ca ca makes no sense unless uh, you uh, you know that exercise goes forward in, in their scheme of things uh, and uh, it's not and <clears throat> the national register of citizens cannot be compiled without this going through 
And, and as I said, there's a lot of contradictory statements made by what NPR is, what uh, NRC is, and what is the relationship between CAA, NPR, and NRC. So uh, when, when, the, when uh, chief ministers or, and in some cases, state assemblies have passed resolutions saying we will not implement it. It sets up a, a possible confrontation, but if several state governments, including governments where BJP is an a, a, you know, a, a ally or a partner, uh, come out with this position, it's going to be very hard for the central government to uh, force this through. For, and you have to see this in conjunction. Otherwise, it makes no sense. The amendment itself, CAA itself, will make no sense except in uh, unless seen in, uh, in you know in an interlocked relationship with the other two projects, and uh, so implementation is going to prove to be quite a challenge. It could be tense. It could create a lot of political instability in the country, uh, and we cannot predict at this point how how the whole thing will go. But uh, uh, Mr. Amit Shah's recent statement suggests they are still at the job, on the job. There was some doubt during the pandemic, that whole year of 2020, particularly after the lockdown, whether, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about the few of this project, about this project, its future. But now he's again uh, referred back to it. So I, I don't know how long vaccination of uh, a large section of the population of 1.2 billion, of course, children are not going to be vaccinated. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, it will involve hundreds of millions. Uh, so when that is going to be achieved and when they will say that we are ready to go ahead. So that's uh, not, that is uncertain. But, uh, and I refer to that as one of the key aspects, the impact on federal relations. And that's what the question deals with. And I think it's good that uh, the Chief Minister of Kerala, Chief Minister Pinarayi Vijayan and others who... Uh, even those belonging to different part, political parties, uh, including co the Congress party, have uh, come out against this on the grounds that it is unconstitutional. The CAA. Uh, the second question is uh, related to uh, the way political parties are mobilizing people uh, in a manner that um, uh, they tend to uh, reinforce uh, religious demarcation. I think that is, I'm not, not just reading the entire uh, question, but uh, the, summarizing the, the text. Uh, all political parties are uh, mobilizing people in, a, in a such a manner that they, they tend to reinforce religious division and so on. So, so CAA uh, will be useful in that sense for, for them. The question is whether this will ultimately undermine the very secular uh, framework of this country. Yes, I think, uh, of course, the, we can't equate those who are uh, waging a war against uh, the secular fabric of the Constitution and, and to the extent society has progressed in the direction, to that extent. Uh, we can't equate them with those who are defending those values. Uh, and if, uh, if Muslims, for example, are being mobilized against it, that should be seen as a defense of rights, uh, not that we approve of any communal, uh, an appeal to this community or that community uh, or caste for that matter, but uh, you can't equate those who, the offend, those who conducted the offensive with the, with the perceived victims of this. But uh, certainly it will undermine political stability and will undermine uh, the democratic, why democratic, how is democracy threatened? Because it, it's a very authoritarian way of dealing with this question. This is just being rammed down the country's throat. Uh, uh, this whole this surveillance oriented authoritarian approach to uh, you know, citizenship regime. It's done in installments. <coughs> it's not done overnight. And that's an important point to remember. So if they, push aggressively to implement CAA in conjunction with uh, uh, NPR and NRC, then I think uh, there's going to be a lot of political trouble uh, in different parts of the country between different sections. 
and political parties, whether you like it or not, they will mobilize uh, on uh, religious lines, on uh, uh, ethnic lines, and so on. For, for example, in Assam, it's not their problem is quote all foreigners, and in fact, uh, in the final uh, final draft, which the present BJP government has not accepted. Uh, Hindus uh, who have been identified as foreigners to be deported or detained or deported, the bulk of them are Hindus, not Muslims. And this poses a huge problem. And the people in Assam, you know, the, the Assam, uh, so-called indigenous communities uh, are, uh, are not happy at all with this. They are not going to accept this. So that issue has been, in Assam, that draft has been shelved. They're no longer talking about it. So I don't know how long it'll take to do it all over again, this, uh, this compilation of a list of uh, foreigners. Originally, I think 4 million people, and then it's been brought down to under two. So a majority being Hindus. So they are bound to mobilize along these lines, but uh, it's... Uh, so if, if the government is, uh, wants to avoid the central government, political instability, and if they want to sort of uh, uh, show up, you know, got not let the political situation get into trouble, political instability to grow, then it will withdraw the CAA or uh, put it on uh, ice for the time being. But uh, it's, it's not going to do it because it is, uh, as I said, it's a long term project. It's very, very actually from 1985. But from 89 onwards, it became uh, an obsession. Uh, if you just start to study BJP manifestos, which I have done in this uh, essay, uh, it's very, very clear what their uh, game plan, what their objective is. Uh, but the constitution stood in the way and uh, uh, Assam created a major problem. Oh, okay. We have a couple of questions more. Do you have time, sir? Yes, I have time. Yeah. If you, are, if you have time, I have time. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Adu Midris has raised a very interesting question. Yeah, in India, we, we already had a, a very liberal citizenship provision for granting citizenship to people from outside. Where, is, where was this need for a new law, a new legislation for citizenship? He, he's asking this question whether there was any 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 problem already with regard to granting of citizenship to anyone that was that's a very interesting question yes um, uh, yes in fact the you you have to go back to the beginnings the commencement of the constitution in fact there is a book called how on how uh, how indians became uh, voters before they become citizens it's a, it, it really starts with that and it's remarkable if you study the Constituent Assembly debates uh, relevant to the citizenship question, and also the provisions made in the Constitution on citizenship, that it was so inclusive. Uh, the problem, as they saw it, is a political problem. It arose in uh, Assam originally, uh, because uh, there were, I think, uh, after the uh, formation of Bangladesh and during the genocidal period, in, in, uh, uh, in, you know, in East Pakistan, the army committed atrocities uh, and so on. And Bangladesh became a new, a new nation. A lot of people, very large numbers came to India and uh, cl clearly there has been uh, a flow from across the border into India. In fact, some of them have never, you know, there are grandchildren, they've never set foot on any foreign soil. They've always been on in, in India, any of them. And they were given the right to vote. The, the, the need for the BJP was that it thought that uh, this large infusion of uh, Muslims largely, but also there are some Hindus. Yeah, actually, uh, for the Assam agitators, Bengalis, not Hindu or Muslim. Be all Bengalis were a problem for the chauvinist movement that uh, we saw uh, in, in the 80s. Some of, some of it was very violent, even terrorist. Uh, uh, and uh, that, so that developed into a problem for the BJP because in larger states, particularly in West Bengal, they saw that uh, they accused 
the left parties and uh, the Congress in particular also of uh, uh, practicing vote ban politics, giving uh, the right to vote to uh, the so-called illegal uh, immigrants and so on. That was the political uh, background to uh, working out this project. There was absolutely no need because if people come over and they're refugees, ref refugees have a route to citizenship in many, many, in many countries. But India is not a subscriber to the refugee, International Refugee Convention. It's a problem. India has done well with respect to some refugees, but without getting into a proper uh, you know, uh, legal framework, it depends on political discretion. So it would have been easy, it, not easy, it would have been possible to solve this, uh, the refugee question in the Northeast, starting with Assam, but also in West Bengal, because once you come to Assam, you can go to other parts of the country, other states, Bengalis will naturally gravitate to West, uh, parts of West Bengal, but they're also in Assam, they were driven away. There were atrocities conducted against Bengalis in Assam. Uh, all this, uh, uh, help the BJP because they, they, uh, you know, their propaganda, uh, the rise of the BJP in West Bengal was partly aided by this, and they seized on the issue. If you look at it objectively, there is absolutely no need to enact this. So why did the Congress government, uh, in fact, uh, conduct the NPR? I think in 2010, the uh, Manmohan uh, Manmohan Singh government. Uh, it, what, why did they conduct an NPR, which was clearly you know, linked to citizenship, the idea of uh, citizen versus alien, illegal migrant? Uh, where was the need to do it? And that created a lot of uh, trouble. So it is this uh, movement away from citizenship, uh, away from secularism, a secular approach and an inclusive approach to the citizenship question that has led to this. So the question is interesting, Professor, as you said, mm -hmm. but uh, the answer lies in politics. <laughs> Thank you. So the next question is, uh, uh, do you think uh, the BJP is trying to spread Islamophobia and make them marginalized by using other communities in the country? This They're question. trying to do it, but I think uh, uh, as uh, President uh, Narayanan said in this uh, in this conversation on uh, uh, which was broadcast on Doordarshan and All India Radio and covered widely, uh, where I was the I was the interviewer uh, on August 14, 1998. In the long term, this is not going to work. Uh, this because uh, I think. You know, some people get disheartened today that, oh, they, they are the majority, they, they have seized on this uh, weapon of majoritarianism uh, uh, and uh, we haven't done well enough for the, since independence or since we adopted the constitution and this has got undermined for various reasons, including uh, economic policy reasons. We have become weakened, these institutions have become soft, they have become uh, uh, weak, they have been subverted to some extent, not just by the B, BJP and its uh, communal policy, uh, Hindutva, but also by other forces. You, cannot, you know, neoliberal policies uh, weaken, soften the ground on which we stand. So uh, that, that sometimes uh, leads to despair among people who, uh, who are secular and democratic and believe in equal rights for all. But... Uh, over the long term, I think it will be hard to uh, sustain this. There are 200 million plus Muslims in India. You can't, they're not going to target all of them. Uh, although some of them think that. And in turn, I think uh, Muslims should not, you know, you know, get more and more, uh, 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 you know, withdrawn and so on and feel that they are victims so on. This is also a sort of separatism within India uh, is, is to be avo avoided. And there are also, you see it in different parts of India, uh, extremism in the name of Islam, what they call Isla Islamist uh, tendencies and so on.
So you have problems of that kind. And uh, so Islamophobia is, the, is one, one side of the coin and the reaction should also be secular and uh, smart. You can't play into their hands. The more you behave as uh, you know, narrow-minded, somebody who is always on the defensive, the more you, uh, you provide them uh, new uh, op opportunity to target you and uh, so on. So they, you should, I think they shouldn't get into that state, a state of mind. But uh, ally with, uh, it's not a Muslim question. That's the point. They may be seen as primary, they fee, may feel we are primarily the targets, but it's not a Muslim question. It's a question of uh, uh, the constitution. It's a question of uh, the values of the constitution. Justice, uh, liberty, equality, fraternity. Fraternity is very important also uh, in this way. So I think, uh, and that is what I think President Narayan and, uh, presented in his own way because he couldn't speak out uh, the way he would have wanted because he was president of India at that time. But that, it's very clear the undertone of uh, that. In the long term, that's his basic answer. Anybody who uh, seeks to subvert secularism and democracy in India cannot get away with it. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question. I do not know whether it is, uh, it is time for. Dimbi, uh, what do you think? Hello? He can't hear you, I think. Unmute. It'll be the last, it'll oh, be the last okay. piece. I think, uh, let us uh, wind up. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, time is running out. Okay. So, so uh, uh, please uh, request uh, Joy Alaman, the director of uh, Kila, to propose a uh, of thanks. Good evening. Uh, Dignitaries, friends and colleagues, uh, this is the session for vote of thanks. In fact, I don't want to use adjectives and adverbs about the speech, the lecture made by Sri N. Ram. I mean, it was so contemporary a topic and he had put it in such a way that it had an historical uh, context, the current scenario, and a futuristic perspective, especially I was uh, I mean, interested to hear from him that the game is not at over, but it's not a time for us to be complacent. We need to move on and fight further. So that is the context in which uh, uh, he narrated the rights bearing citizenship in the time of Hindutva, very current topic, which I would say. I mean, we, we, the Institute of Parliamentary Affairs and the Kerala Institute of Local Administration, Kila, are very happy to have, uh, to have you with us today and also extend our sincere gratitude for being with us today evening. In fact, uh, we are also happy that uh, you took all the questions which came in, uh, even though the time was up. So thank you, Sri Ram. Yeah. And we had this session moderated by Professor K.M. Siti, who is an insider in one way because he is the director of the India University Center for Social Science Research and Extension, Mahatma Gandhi University, Kotem, um, and who has been a very close friend of KILA and the Institute of Parliamentary Affairs. So thank you, sir, for efficiently moderating and chairing this session. Okay. And finally, from the side of KILA, I would have to say, I will have to say that uh, we are so grateful to Professor DMB and team at uh, Institute of Parliamentary Affairs, not just for this session alone, over these so many months, you have been actually taking Kila to a new direction by bringing in a lot of new topics, which are very I mean, I mean, current topics, and also bringing in stalwarts of uh, experts and uh, intellectuals uh, for such initiatives. So thank you, Dimbi and team, for uh, being bringing in Kila also to your fold and taking us forward also for all this lecture series. Okay, and finally the participants. I mean, all these lectures here throughout this lecture series, we have been having a good number of participants, not just passive listeners, but actually involving it. Especially if you go through the chat box and all, we really have a 
from a real intellectual discussion and discourses on some of these topics we, we discussed. Thank you all. Thank you, the team, for uh, making this uh, program uh, well done. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I also thank Amrita Narayanan for uh, attending the program. She was throughout the lecture. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ram, sir. Thank you, Siddhi, sir. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you. Thank you.